Jesus. Hallelujah. Can we rise this morning to our feet to tell God thank you? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. God, you're so mighty. God, you're so strong. Hallelujah. I come to praise him. I come to magnify him. And the song that we usher in before the Lord this morning is I love to praise him. The Bible says that everything that have breath, praise the Lord. So if we don't praise him, the rocks will cry out. The walls will find a way to praise him. But I guarantee we won't praise the Lord this morning. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah.
Amen. Let's give our children a round of applause. Amen. Come on, let's, we can do better. Let's give them a big round of applause. Praise the Lord. Amen. We thank God for our children, our youth. We thank God for those who are working with them. We thank God for our young ushers that are standing on the door around the walls. And we thank God for our music department, our men and male chorus, and uh, for those in AV and all those who are with our young people making this day of worship what it is to be. Amen. How many are glad to be in the house of the Lord today? Amen. We're thankful for you. We're thankful for those who are live streaming, and we trust and pray that whatever takes place or transpires today will literally be for the glory of God, but for the good of all of us as we strive to become all that God has ordained for us to be. We're going to prepare to uh, go to the altar, and so uh, I'm going to ask that we would stand, come to the altar. Uh, you can kneel where you are. You can come forth. You can join hands and hearts with the persons next to you across the aisle. But we do want to pray and seek God's face. And uh, we're going to pray for Sister Sonda Harris. Continue to lift her up. Sister Bernice Jones. Brother Isaac Johnson, who was actually back here today with us. Be in prayer for all of our family members, Ms. Dolores Jones, and all of those who've had uh, death in their families. Be in prayer for all of our family members. Pray for all marriages and relationships. Pray for all the single men and women, single families. Pray for this nation. Pray for our country. Pray for our communities. Pray for our church families and the church as a whole. Amen. There's so many things to pray about. And God says if we pray, the fervent and effectual prayer of a righteous person does much good. So don't ever feel that your prayer life, if you feel like I don't have anything to offer, you can offer up a prayer. And if you offer up that prayer by faith, believing without a shadow of a doubt that what you pray for in the will of God, God promises he'll give that to you. Amen. So uh, I'm going to ask Minister Rose to come and lead us in prayer this morning. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let us go to God in prayer. Father God in heaven, first, Lord, before we ask you for anything, we have to say thank you. Lord, you brought us through some things, Father, we never thought we would go through. But, Lord God, thank you for Jesus. We just love you, Lord God. The families now, Father God, that are dealing with deaths, sickness, pain, hurt. Lord God, touch them, Father God, right now. I ask you to pray for all marriages as well, Father. Lift them up, Father God, as you have designed them to be. Lord God, I'd like to pray for this congregation. Help us, Father God, to do what you have called us to do, Father, to be your servant. Lord God, we just thank you for the servant you place over this congregation. Lord God, lead God and direct them and bless them, Father God, as only you can. Allow your Holy Spirit to work through him and to him and for him. Lord, please bless his wife and his family that is by his side. Strengthen them, Father God, as they stand there by their, uh, their family, their husband, their father, their grandfather, Lord God, while you lead him. Lord God, I ask you just bless all the ministry, the, the staff here, Father God. Help us, Father God, to do what you called us to do, Lord. We're not here for ourselves. We're here for you to give you the honor and the glory to lead others to you, Father God. We just thank you for the calling. Lord God, every person that is, has a position here, Father God, is from the ushers, from the AV, Father God, is from staff, is from every person in the congregation. Touch us, Father God, to do you, your holy will. We bless you, Lord God. We love you and we thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Come on, give God another hand clap of praise. Do not pass me by. Amen. It's one of them uh, songs back in the day. But it wasn't just a request for God not to pass you by. It says, while on others you are calling. In other words, I want to be used in your service. How many got that testimony or that desire? God, if you need somebody, send me. Amen. That's been my desire since I've been saved. God, if you need somebody, send me. I really want to be used of God. I don't just want to be a Sunday morning Christian. I've always, from the age of 22, when God changed my life, I've been in the service of the Lord. It's my ultimate desire to please him. And I found out that there's no greater joy than serving God. How many know there's no greater joy than giving your life to Christ and literally spending your life for his glory? We thank God for this mail course. As we move forward, again, we want to just thank God for each and every one of you. I don't know if we've already done the welcome. Have we had, do we have any first-time visitors with us? Any first-time visitors with us today? Anyone visiting for the first time? Praise the Lord. All right. Praise God. I just want to say we're so happy that you've come to share with us and those who are live streaming. If you're streaming for the first time, we're happy that you've come and joined us, and we trust and pray that something will be said or done in service through song, sermon, or scripture that will encourage you and strengthen you for life's journey. And so we welcome you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, on behalf of the entire body of First Baptist Church. Amen. Let's give God some praise for our visitor. Amen. Praise the Lord. Come on, we can do better now. Let's give it up for him. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Thank you so much. As we move forward, I've got a few uh, quick announcements now. I had a bulletin. I forgot what I did with it. But if you have a bulletin, I don't need one, but if you have a bulletin, you will notice there's a lot of information in those bulletins. So much so, it's almost become a small book. And so uh, one of the goals is that with that kind of information, we want to eliminate making a lot of uh, requests and uh, oral beckonings and, and solicitations from the podiums because we want you to read those bulletins and uh, understand what's going on and to govern yourselves accordingly. And so I'm asking that you would read those bulletins, a lot of information about everything that's going on in the church. There's so much going on. It just takes too much time to go through it all. But there's a couple of special announcements. I want to see all the uh, meet with all the ministers immediately after service for those who are here or meet in the conference room. And then we want to encourage you to come out on Wednesday nights and our noonday Bible studies. We have some wonderful time in studies. We go through the uh, letter to First Timothy in the noon, through the book of James in the evening. So come out and join us for that. Also, beginning on next Sunday, or the, uh, we will also have uh, the J.L. Roberts School of Religion that will take place in the city. And we're asking for those that will come to meet at First Virginia Avenue Baptist Church. Uh, pastor Duncan is the pastor, host pastor. And so we have a great turnout from all the churches in Central District. And uh, a lot of people come out, great classes, and we need you to pre-register. So if you plan to go into classes, you need to call the church, get the information so you can pre-register and be in those classes. Also on next Sunday, we have an evening service at 4 p.m. at Israel Baptist Church as we help them celebrate their church anniversary. As we know, our church anniversary is also in April, and so God is blessing us, and we're asking you to get ready for that. It's going to be a great time in the Lord. Amen. And so let's continue to pray for our church. And also, uh, Sister Ira Sauls, as you know, has six McDonald's, a member of our church. And uh, she is doing another grand opening of her, one of her McDonald's at 5600 Preston Highway. That's right off the corner of Indian Trail and Preston Highway. And she's having a, a new grand opening or on, uh, at 11 a.m. from 11 to 1 on this Thursday coming, the 15th. So let's go ahead and patronize her and let's support her. She's always been a great uh, worker, not just contributor, but a worker here at the church. And then finally, uh, last week we announced that on Sunday from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. we have 35 and over league. Now we may not have that many 35 and overs that can run up and down the court. So we're going to invite somebody just a little bit younger if y'all want to go, come. Because we can still handle y'all. And... Uh, so if you want to come out, now I'm going to say this serious, I'm not joking. 
I forgot about it last week. I intended to be here. And so I made myself a promise. I will be there this evening to play. And all week long, my bones have been hurting like my body's talking to me, like, don't go, don't go. I mean, don't, wake, wake up, just don't do it. Because I've been feeling it all week long. I mean, seriously, ever since I said I was going to be there, I've had all kind of aches and pains and stuff just happening. And so I'm going to listen to my body. If I do come, I'm either coach, I'm a cheerlead for somebody. Just got to, amen. <laughs> I'm not going to hurt myself. Last, last time I played basketball, I was playing my youngest son. And you know when, you, when, you, when, you, when you're out there on the court, you, you got this mind that believe you can do what you used to do. And I spit on him and twisted my ankle. I mean, just one spin, that's all it took. And I limped off the court like that, and so I said, I'm going to do that again. But for those that want to come out, it's just a time of fun. And like I said last week, we don't have fast breaks. We have slow breaks. Amen. We walk up and down the court. Amen. It's something about getting older, you get more patient. Amen. It's just not because you have to, because I mean, not because you want to, but because you have to. At this time, we want to celebrate all the birthdays. Anybody celebrating their birthday in the month of March? Stand on your feet as we celebrate with you all March babies. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. Come on now. Praise God. You know, Mar March babies are those babies that spring forth new life. Amen. Nobody said amen. Okay, let's. <laughs> I try to help y'all. Okay. On the count of three. One, two, three. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Amen. Give God a hand clap of praise for all of these. Our members, may God give you many, many more. Now, if you got married in the month of March and uh, you're here today and you want to celebrate, want us to celebrate with you, stand on your feet. You got married in uh, March, in March. All right, there's one. All right. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Mr. Calvin. No. What that mean? Miss Denise. <laughs> See, that's when you know you've been married a long time. You just keep pointing back. Go ask your daddy. Go ask your mama. <laughs> 37. Come on with it. All right. Congratulations. Mr. Chuck. 23. All right. Praise the Lord. Well, we celebrate with you all and pray that God give you many, many more wonderful, blissful, cheerful years as one couple, amen. And they got them grandbabies now and they just whole new focus, amen. All right, where are we? This time we're supposed to take up our offering. We're gonna ask one of our ministers to come and take up our offering as we pray over it. And then we're gonna also, there are five ways of giving. You can give by way of our kiosk, you can give cash or check in the trays here at First Baptist. You can also have direct deposit and uh, you can do it online, so Brother Tim. Good morning, First Baptist. It is offering time. We can do better than that. It's offering time. Let's stand on our feet, please. We'll have our ushers come forward. Remember, it's better to give than to receive. And God has blessed you, so he asks that you return back to him what he has given to you, correct? Can I get an amen? If we can do better than that, can I get an amen? How many got a paycheck this Friday? Not very many? I understand. We'll go ahead and bow our heads, please. Heavenly Father, we come before you today, give you all the glory, honor, and praise. We thank you for the ability to give back to your kingdom. We thank you for everything you have blessed us with, the opportunities to make income, Heavenly Father, the opportunities to have our households taken care of with the income that you have provided for us. And we're just thankful, Heavenly Father, that we are able to come back into your house of worship and give back to you what you have so graciously given to us. It is in your Son, Jesus Christ, that we pray and ask it all. Amen. If you can follow the directions of your ushers.
check.
His name is a power to save and set us free. There's so much power in the name. blind to see oh Jesus healed a man with leprosy his name has a power to save and set us free there's so much power in the name
one of my mics on. Which one is on? All right, come on. Amen. Let's pray. God, we thank you in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Christ, for the privilege of worshiping you in spirit and in truth. I pray, God, now as we attempt to delve into your word, that you would free our minds from all things that the devil would intend to rob us and to distract us from seeing you for who you are and from hearing from you. Set our minds and our hearts on things above and not on the things of this world. Make yourself known among us strong and mighty. And make yourself known among us clear and succinct. God, we'll be careful to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. We confess our unworthiness but we definitely express our gratitude for the bountiful blessings that you bestow upon each and every one of us. God, I can't and we can't do anything good without you. But with you, God, we believe we can do all things. You know the hearts and the minds of each and every one of us who are here today. You know what we stand in need of. So speak now, God. And we'll be careful to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. We ask it in Jesus' name, our Lord and our Christ, along with the forgiveness of our sins. And the church says, amen. 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 As we prepare to go into the word, uh, you can go ahead and let those in if you like. Uh, go ahead and let those in as we get ready. Um, first of all, let me just express my gratitude for all of you who are here today today. And for all of you who are live streaming, and for your continued faithfulness, amen. You are the church, and so we thank God for each and every one of you, and pray that you continually come. Reach out to your friends, your family members, invite them to come, because God is doing a great work here at First Baptist Church of Jefferson Town. Let's give God a hand clap of praise in this house, amen. Amen. Come on, let's give it up. God is worthy. God has brought us from a mighty long way. And since 1833, we've been in this, on this corner by the grace of God from generation to generation. That same God has kept us. Amen. And uh, our theme this year is knowing God in Christ, growing in God in Christ, sowing God in Christ. And once you get saved, I reiterate that uh, as I've done, said before, but just to reiterate it, once you get saved, it's your responsibility and my responsibility to grow in Christ. And to grow in Christ and to grow in God in Christ, you've got to know him. Amen. You've got to know him beyond just a Sunday morning experience. And so it's my responsibility to not only preach salvation and how to get saved, but according to Ephesians 4 and 11, the Bible tells us that God gave forth some apostles and prophets and evangelists and uh, pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the maturation and maturity of the saints, to teach them. 
And so it's my responsibility to the best of my ability as the Lord teaches me that I pour that into you. Because you want to get beyond just being a Sunday morning Christian. Amen. You want to know the Lord. Amen. How many really want to know the Lord and grow in him? And so all the themes and everything we strive to do here is literally to help us. I'm not just here to shout. We shout. We, we get happy and all those things. But my goal is to grow us so that we become closer to God and God will literally become our God and our guide. And so uh, we know that the gospel in, its, in and of itself is teaching and preaching that Christ came into this world by way of virgin birth. He hung, bled, and died, was buried and risen, got up on the third day with all power in his hands, and literally sits on the right hand of the Father now and will come back again for his church. If I don't mention that during the sermon, I just preach the gospel. Amen. That is the gospel according to 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, in a nutshell, that the scripture teaches us that Jesus Christ came into this world and died for the sins of the world, was buried, and rose again on the third day according to scriptures. That's the gospel. But I want us to go now into a deeper revelation of God as we begin for the next three or four weeks, or at least three, where we talk about the Trinity. Hopefully we'll grasp and glean from the scriptures a better understanding of what it means to have one God in three persons. Because logically, it doesn't make sense. So I want us to turn to Ephesians, the third chapter. Ephesians, the third chapter, verses 14. And so I'm going to just try to walk through this and teach. And then next week, we're going to kind of get into a deeper uh, uh, revelation of God's word. But I want to lay a foundation as we talk about this right now. Ephesians, the third chapter, verse 14. And I'm also going to be looking at Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and verse 26. For this reason, I bow my knee, knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he will grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly all that we can ask, think, or imagine, through the power or according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. And we'll be coming back to this scripture for the next couple of weeks. But I want us to re uh, look at verse 18 again, that we may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And then in Genesis, the first chapter, verse one, the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the very beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then in verse 26, God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and over the cow and all the earth and all over every creeping thing that creeps up on the earth. And God made them male and female. God blessed them. I want to talk to you today from the subject, knowing your God. One God in three persons, the Trinity. Amen. Knowing your God. One God in three persons, the Trinity. Pray with me because we had such a high time at the 8 o'clock service. My voice is a little sore now, but I uh, pray that God would help us. A lot of people in the world make the tragic mistake of not taking the initiative or the time or the opportunity to understand and get to know the true God. There are several people in the world, even in this nation, 
that say they can't believe in a God that they can't see. Therefore, men have gone about to create their own gods, which is foolish because anything that you can invent or create and then place it over you, that says something about your lack of intelligence. Because if you made it, it's absurd and foolish that you would put it that you made over you. And while as ludicrous as that sounds, there are many people who have made idols of things and have called them gods. One of the things that comes to my mind is the religion of Buddha. I've always thought it's kind of strange to have this big statue that you kneel down to, made of man-made elements, created by a man, and then you pray to it. There are other people who suggest that they can't believe in God because they can't see God. And I maintain that if you had a God you could see, he wouldn't be God. Because when you understand the name or the title God, in Genesis 1, 1, Elohim, the God who controls all things and who created all things, he's above all things. So if he is God and you could understand him or if you could be able to comprehend him, you would literally be equal to God. A good example of that or illustration of that is for those of us who have children or grandchildren that when your children are born into this world, you brought them into the world by way of birth, and they grow up in, you, up in your home and under your care and your nurturing. However, when they're young, they know very little about what you are about as being an adult. And as a result, because their level of intelligence is not on the level of your intelligence, they can't comprehend why you do some of the things you do. And it doesn't make sense to them. And sometimes even when you try to explain it to them, they can't comprehend it. Well, if that's the truth between humans, imagine how difficult it must be to try to understand God with our finite minds. You see, in the very first chapter of Genesis, when God chooses Moses as his agent to unveil his divine historical account of creation, and how all things began from the very beginning, you and I are privileged to glean and to gain from that particular passage of scripture a basic knowledge, or an inkling at least, of the Trinitarian God who is one God in three persons. It is in this passage of scripture that we are first introduced to the mysterious nature of this monotheistic God, mono meaning one, and theistic, meaning a God who created and controls all things in the universe. And yet in that same passage, we discover the triune nature of God, of this monotheistic God, which is called the Trinity that's not found in the Bible. Notice, if you will, in verse 1, that the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God, singular. In the beginning, God, one God, created the heavens and the earth. But then when you fast forward to verse 26, the Bible says that God, Elohim says, let us make man, singular but plural. Verse 1 says, in the beginning, God, singular. Verse 26 says, let us, plural, one God, three persons. Now, we won't be able to cover that today, but I wanted to set a, and establish a foundation so that we can understand what we believe in as Christians when we talk about believing the Trinity or the Trinitarian God. So I want to help us as we walk through this particular passage of Scripture, as we look at Ephesians again, and we'll look at some Scriptures that will bring us to an enlightenment of what it means to better understand and to better know and to grow in this one God who is three persons. Let me begin by saying this, that it is impossible to fully comprehend and explain the true nature of God. Let me just start by, I don't care how smart we are. I don't care what 
researcher, what theologian, what scholar it is, no man can fully understand God or comprehend God in totality. And that's because there are several things that have been established by way of our human nature and by God's divine design that prevents us from knowing God in the fullness of who God is. Now that may sound like contradictory uh, according to the word because when you look at Ephesians, if you will, in verse 17 it says that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with the fullness of God. And while it is possible to be filled with the fullness of God, it is impossible to fully comprehend God. Because the human mind is finite and too finite to fully understand this infinite nature of an almighty, all-powerful God who called nothing into something. It's impossible for your mind or my mind or any mind to fully comprehend God in the fullness of who he is as God. You see, the Bible helps us to understand because the human mind, finite, limited, no matter how intelligent we are, what our IQs are, we are limited. We, we, we cannot know it all. And that's why we have what we call science because science is a means of exploration which means we're always discovering something new because we're finite. We're finite creatures limited to our understanding and to that which has been unveiled or exposed to us. That's why my brothers and sisters, even in today's society, you can read some article and it will tell you today that milk is bad for you. And then you read it six months later and it says it's good for you. Because, I, because our understanding of life in totality is based on what we learn. And, and because we have to learn it, we are limited until we learn it. And so the reason it's impossible to fully understand or comprehend this triune God is because the human mind is too finite to fully understand the infinite nature and wisdom of an almighty all power for God. And that's where a lot of people miss it. They say, I'm not going, I'm not going to serve a God that I can't understand. Well, if you could understand him, he wouldn't be God. Amen. And if you could fully understand him, you wouldn't need faith. Because God is bigger. In fact, let's turn to Isaiah, the 55th chapter, and look at verses 8 and 9, because it helps us understand why you and I, as much as we may try, and we should strive to get to know all that we can about God, but you will never fully understand God in his total divine nature. Watch this in Isaiah 55. It says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, think about that, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. And so in Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9, the Bible teaches us that one of the reasons we can't fully comprehend God is because God's ways are too high for our ways. And his thought process is so far from our thought process. That's why when it comes to God walking by faith, we got to believe in the God that's bigger than us. You can't believe in God based on what you see, based on what you feel, based upon what you think. If God said it, you got to understand if he said it, he said it from his intelligence and his power, not yours. And so it's impossible to fully comprehend this, the triune nature of God, because the human mind is too finite, too limited to comprehend or understand an infinite or unlimited God. The second thing I want to suggest when we look at Psalms 145 and 3, the Bible helps us understand why we cannot fully grasp his greatness. It says, great is the Lord. How many know God is great? And greatly to be praised. Can I just park here for a moment? If you realize that God is great, ain't no way you will come up in here 
any day and just sit. The Bible says God is not only great, but greatly to be praised. And can I help somebody? You don't have to wait till Sunday. If he's a great God, he's great on Monday. He's great on Tuesday. He's great on Wednesday. He's great on Thursday. He's great on Friday. He's great on Saturday. And he's great on Sunday. He's great in the morning. He's great at noonday. He's great in the evening. And he's great at the midnight hour. God is a great God. And because of his greatness, he is to be greatly praised. That means you ought to put everything in it. All of the, every fiber of your being, you ought to use it to glorify him. That's what our foreparents used to say and what they meant when they said, if I couldn't say a word, I just, come on. If I, if I didn't have a voice, I just wave my hand. That's how great he is. If I couldn't, if I couldn't lift up my hands, I, I just shake my head and I let somebody know that God is a great God and greatly to be praised. But watch this. The scripture says the reason we can't fathom him and understand him or comprehend him is because his greatness is unsearchable. That is to say that from the very beginning of time when God created Adam and Eve until the last day that the last person would breathe their breath on this earth, nobody would be able to fully understand God because he's that great and he's so great his ways are unsearchable. The second thing we notice in Romans, the third thing in Romans 11, 33, it helps us understand and kind of substantiates what we've already said. But in that particular passage, it just kind of helps us to understand. It says, oh, the death of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgment and his ways past finding out. And that does not suggest we ought to not pursue him and try to get to know all that we can about him, it just suggests that no matter what we know about him or what we learn about him, we will never know him or fully comprehend him in his total divine nature. The second thing, the reason it's impossible to fully comprehend and explain the triune nature of God is because the only knowledge we have of God is the knowledge that God has chosen to unveil about himself through his son Jesus Christ and the scriptures that we call the Word of God. Turn with me to John, the first chapter, verse 18, and you'll discover what I'm talking about. The Bible says no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. So the Bible teaches us that if anybody learns anything about God, it has to come through Jesus Christ, our Lord. In fact, we get a deeper revelation of that when we turn to John 14, verses 6 and 7, when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father except through me. You'll never see God unless you come through Christ. But watch this. He says, if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Why? Because Jesus is saying, if you've seen God, you've seen me. And if you've seen me, you've seen God. And we'll get into that trial nature later, but it helps us understand the only knowledge we can gain of God is the knowledge that God gives us or that the knowledge that he unveils about himself. That's why every believer and every Christian ought to search the scriptures and every other book they can to find out all of they can about God. But even with all of that, we will never know him in totality. Watch this. Because the only knowledge we have of God is the knowledge that God has chosen to unveil about himself through Christ and through scripture. Look at John, the 20th chapter, if you will. The Bible says, and truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. Notice verse 21, or 31, I'm sorry. But these are written that you may believe. Notice this, the scripture we have, this book that is the word of God. It was written with you in mind. It's written that you might believe. Notice that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So God has given us his word. He has unveiled a portion of himself to us through written scripture so that you and I can get to know him so that we can be saved by him. Another scripture that jumps out is 2 Peter 1, verses 20 and 21, where the Bible teaches us that God has literally done a, a marvelous work. Notice this. It says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture 
is of any private interpretation. You got a lot of people say that, that I ain't going to believe the Bible because man wrote it. Well, the truth is, everything we believe, some man wrote it. Talk to me, somebody. Everything we hinge our knowledge, our faith, or our understanding on, some person wrote it. Now, the truth is, man did write the Bible. But God inspired that man or those men by way of his Holy Spirit. The Bible was literally written over a period of 15 to 1600 years by 40 different men who a couple knew each other, but majority did not know of each other. And God spoke to each person individually and they prophesied based upon what God said without understanding what God had told them. That's what true prophecy is. I know we got a lot of people call themselves prophets today, but I don't believe in them. Because every one of them got a good word. Nobody's telling you to repent and get right. Nobody's telling you to seek the Lord with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Nobody's telling you that God is warning us that if we don't get right as a nation, as a church, as a people, he will destroy us. That's what true prophets did. Now that everybody who calls himself a prophet got a, a word for you. God's getting ready to do. And if you sow this seed, I promise you, God is going to give you, give me, yeah, if you sow $58.17 in 58 days and 17 minutes, God is getting ready to do. No, that ain't no profit. He said these men that God used prophesied. And they never prophesied on their own. Notice this in verse 21. For prophecy never came by the will of man. And let me just suggest anybody that, that knows what that means. First of all, if you were a man, you would never volunteer to be a prophet. But holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. That is to say, without understanding, God, by way of his Holy Spirit, speaks into the lives of men, and they open their mouths without fully understanding all that they're saying. A typical of example of that is as we walk through these next two next few uh, weeks, I just started out by saying what? I can't explain God. All I can do is give you what God has given me. Because God cannot be fully comprehended. And so these people, these men who spoke, they spoke by way of prophecy, believing what God has said. And I shared at the 8 o'clock service, I said one of the things that's so amazing and so marvelous about this is that when you read scripture, you will discover, and that's why when people say, well, I don't believe the Bible because man wrote it, but there's no way that all the prophecy, 2,000 plus some prophecies, could come to pass in the season that the Bible says they will. You know, we were talking about that in our noonday Bible study on last week, and one of the scriptures that I shared with them and I've shared with you before is in the 11th chapter of Revelation when the Bible says that when the two witnesses on the earth, the earth will be so wicked that, that they will come with power, and then after their season is up and their time is up, it says they will be killed. But watch this by way of prophecy in Revelation, written at least 2,000 years ago. It says, that, it says they will be killed, but here's the prophecy that's so amazing. 2,000 years ago, the apostle John on the island of Patmos writes the words by inspiration of the Holy Spirit as the Holy Spirit speaks to him, and he writes these words that there would be these two witnesses will die, and they will be killed, and they will lay on the ground for three and a half days. And here's the prophecy. And the whole world will see them at the same time. It is no possible way that John or anybody else could have accurately taught or prophesied 2,000 years ago that there would be two men laying in the street and everybody around the world would see them at the same time. Television hadn't been around that long. In fact, I'm, I tell people I'm 60 years of age and, and when we first got a television, television has changed because when I, television used to have three channels. Three. You didn't have no cable and, you know, internet and all that. You had three channels. And at 11 o'clock p.m., the question would be asked, do you know where your children are? And at 12, all you would see on your screen is a circle like a vapor diminishing and all you would see is blackness. Couldn't stay up all night and watch TV back then. 
It hadn't been around that long. But 2,000 years ago, the Apostle John writes that there would be two men laying in the street dead and everybody around the globe would see them. That's a prophecy. And in 2018, we can understand that. We have internet. In fact, we have live people Facebook stuff live all the time. So, so you can watch something in Italy or China while it's happening. We can see that. That's prophecy. But not only is that the most amazing thing about the prophecy, but it also said because these people hated these two men that were killed, they were rejoiced and they sent gifts to each other. Now the Bible says they'll only be on, in, on the ground three and a half days. But in three and a half days, it says they sent gifts to each other. You could have not done that 2,000 years ago. Because the fastest transportation 2,000 years ago was a horse. Possibly 35 miles an hour. Now you try taking a gift from Jerusalem to China at 35 miles an hour. You, you see, you see it's, it's prophetic because it says they will send gifts to each other, which implies the gifts will be received. But we can understand that now because we have UPS, we have the post office, we have FedEx, you can overnight stuff. So in three and a half days, it wouldn't be impossible for us to understand how somebody could send a gift and get it the next day. I've been in the clothing business since 1998, and there are people who came in my store and said, I need this, how soon you can get it? I said, if you pay the price, I overnight it. That's prophecy. And so the Bible teaches us that the only knowledge we have is the knowledge that God has given us. But the knowledge that God has given us is so mighty and so powerful that if we ever got into it and allowed it to get in us, it would transform us for not only life, but for eternity. Because that's the power of God's word. So it's impossible to fully comprehend and explain the triune nature of God because of our human minds are too finite, because the only knowledge we can gain or glean is the knowledge that God has given us. But then thirdly, because God has intentionally, somebody say intentionally, chosen to keep certain things about himself secret or mysterious from us. Look, if you will, in Ecclesiastes, the 8th chapter, verse 17. In Ecclesiastes, the 8th chapter, verse 17, the Bible helps us to understand. It says, then I saw all the work of God, that a man cannot find the work, or find out the work that is done under the sun, for though a man labors to discover it, yet he will not find it, Moreover, though a wise man attempts to know it, he will not be able to find it. Why? Because God has only given us limited knowledge. We are limited creatures with limited knowledge. Look at this next verse, if you will, in Romans 11, 33 again, as we go back to there, because it helps us understand, oh, the depth and the riches, both of wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgment and his ways past finding out. Pursue him with all your heart but you'll never know all you need to know about God. And the purpose behind understanding this is so you won't get discouraged when you get to a point where you feel like there's some things you want to know that you can't know. I mean, God doesn't owe any of us anything. I heard a preacher say just the other day that, that somebody said that, that if God doesn't judge America, he has to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. And I responded by saying God don't have to apologize to anybody. He's God. See, well, the way we view things is different, but God's got a right to do whatever he wants with us. He created us. Even our parents thought like that. Did they not? Some of us who are older, I brought you into the world. That's what man told me. You can say something back if you want to. You can you twist your mouth if you want to. Roll your eyes if you want to, but I brought you in here. And I will tell you, that ain't from Madea, that was from Mama. God has intentionally kept certain things from us because we are finite creatures who can only gain limited knowledge. Secondly, I want to suggest that it's impossible to fully comprehend and explain the nature of God. Secondly, it is possible to know and explain what God has unveiled about himself. See, one of the first things that the Bible helps us understand when we go back to Genesis and throughout the scriptures is that there's only one God, and God is God all alone. 
He's the only one God. In the beginning, God created. God, singular. God created the heavens and the earth. Look at Isaiah 44, verse 6 and 7. And then we're going to go to 45, by 5 and 7. But it helps us understand. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. Notice what he says. I am the first, and I am the last. Besides me, singular, there is no God. Think about that. And who can proclaim it? Now watch this. He, he asked the question, who can proclaim as I do? If you God, can you do what I do? Then let, him desire, then let him declare it and set it in order for me. Since I appointed the ancient people and the things that are coming and shall come, let them show these to them. In other words, God says, I took care of the past. I'm the one that's responsible for the present. And whatever comes in the future, that's by me. Look at Isaiah 45, it'll help us get a better and a clear understanding of this as we understand that there are some things that we can know, basically those things that God has unveiled to us. I am the Lord and there is no other. What did I say? There's one God. There is no other. There is no God beside me. I will gird you though you have not known me. Verse 6. We only, that they may know from the rising of the sun to its setting that there is none beside me. I am the Lord and there is no other. Somebody say there's only one God. One God. And I know we live in a world today in a society where they're, they're, they're actually asking us to join with all faiths. And it's good to get along with everybody, but you can't be one with everybody. There's only one God. Buddha is not God. Hinduism is not serving the right God. There's only one God. And, and, and regardless of what Oprah or anybody else says, that, there's got to, that they can't understand how there would only be one way to God, there's only one way to God. There's only one God and only one way to him. And notice what he says here. This throws, blows our mind. He says, I form the light and the darkness. And then he says, I make peace and create calamity. Some of us wrestle with that. If he's a righteous God, how can he create calamity? He's God. He can do what he want to do. Look at it like this. If I'm wealthy, or let me just say my, my vehicle outside. That's my vehicle. It's paid for. If I decided to burn it up, I got a right to do it. It's mine. People can say I'm dumb. They can say, man, you foolish. Ain't no way you could have at least sold it, got some money off of it, but I can do what I want to do with that vehicle. I owe no person on it. It's mine. And if I decide to let it just go down, it's mine. If I decide to keep it up, it's mine. I make those decisions because I own it. The Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and the world and they that dwell therein. God not only owns the earth, the sun, the moon, the stars, and all the elements in it. God owns you. Genesis 2 and 7 said, God formed man from the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. God owns you. So therefore, and that's why all of us will eventually breathe our last breath. You got to die one day. Amen. God forbid you live this life and think you're big enough to live without God and face him on the other side. On this side, there's grace, but on the other side, there's judgment. Yeah. Ain't but one God. He said, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and calamity. And he says, I, the Lord, do all these things. And what he's saying in essence is, not that he creates all the evil that goes on, he said, I created Satan. Satan is a created being. He's an angel that fell from heaven. And he created him. So any evil that Satan does, he said, I created all of it. Because there's nothing that exists that I didn't create. In fact, let's go to, let's go to this uh, a verse in, Genesis, in, in, in John, the first chapter, 1 and 3. Because God is not only one God alone, but God is self-existent and eternal in his nature. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Don't, don't lose me. He was in the beginning with God. He's speaking of Jesus now. We're going to get to that later. All things were made through him, and without him was nothing made that was made. Everything that exists came through God. Everything. Every big thing, every little thing. Every valuable thing and everything we call without value. It all came by God. How many know he's God by himself? 
He, he's, he's self-existent and eternal. In, this might help you. Let's turn to Colossians, the first chapter, verses 15 through 17. Because this is a little, give a little more clarity to it. Say, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on the earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him. And what? The angels were created for him. Everything that God created was not only created through Christ and by Christ, but for him. That's why I say every time we get a chance, don't waste your life here by saying, well, that's not my personality. I can't praise God. He, pra he created you to praise him. He created you to glorify him. He created you to exalt him. And so every chance you get, you ought to magnify and exalt his name. He is before all things. Watch this. And in him, all things consist. Everything happens because of God. Look at this script in Revelation 21 and 6 and then 1 and 20 in Romans. Walk, as we walk through this thing, we're almost done. We'll be out of here in less than 10 minutes. Why y'all laugh? Wow. <laughs> now like my mama. I said, Ma, I'll be over in 15 minutes. Yeah, whatever. And he said, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. In other words, I'm the very beginning and I'm the very end. Everything in between belongs to me. Look at Romans, if you will, our last verse on this one. In Romans 1 and 20, and the Bible helps us understand for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power in Godhead, so that they are without excuse. God owns it all. He created all of it. And so, and so it's impossible to fully comprehend and explain the total triune nature of God, but it is possible to know and explain what God has unveiled about himself. And in that sense, we ought to pursue him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, because God has revealed himself to those who will believe. In Jeremiah, the 33rd chapter, verse 3, and then in 1 John 5 and 20, and we'll go to our final uh, point here. In Jeremiah 33, verse 3, if we put that on the screen for me if you, real quickly. If not, I'll turn to it. Okay, there it is. Call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. What does the Bible say? God said, call to me. If you need something, call me. But not only will I answer you, I will show you great and mighty things. Are you going through something this morning? And you walk around with your head down, moping about how bad it is? God said, call me. When you call me, I'll show up. I wonder if there are two or three folk in the house that know that when you call on him, he will show up. I ain't asking you to lie. I'm talking about if you got a real life testimony, you've been in a situation that you couldn't get out of yourself and you called on the name of the Lord and God showed up on your behalf. I stopped by to tell somebody, you ought to call on him. But when you call, you got to call by faith. Don't go to him like he might not do it. Don't go to him like he may not be able to do it. You got to walk by faith and not by sight. That's why the Bible tells us in Hebrews 11 and 6 that when we can't understand God, we got to believe him by faith. There's some things I can't understand about him. There's some things I won't be able to ever explain. But I want you to know that we, even if I can't explain it, I still believe it. Because faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I've never seen him with my physical eyes. But I want you to know I believe he's real today. Because in 1979, December 24th, on a Friday evening, God came into my life and the weight of the world fell from me. Is there anybody in the house that's got that testimony? It may not have been on a Friday, but maybe it's on a Saturday or a Sunday. Oh, Monday, 
Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, but the Lord showed up. And your testimony is, I've never seen it, but I know he's real. How you know he's real, preacher? I've been broke, didn't have a dime in my pocket, didn't have a way of getting no money, but I cried unto the Lord, and the Lord made a way out of no way. Anybody in the house got that testimony? Maybe that ain't your testimony. I've been sick with medication, didn't do his job, and I got on my knees, and I called on the name of the Lord. And watch this, sometimes when God doesn't answer, I call some prayer warriors, and the prayers of the righteous have availed much. Anybody know what I'm talking about? God will. Hey, I've not seen him, but I believe him. And somebody said, God is like pain. I can't see it, but I can feel it all on the inside of me. Anybody ever felt it? Anybody know that the Lord dwells? That's why, that's why when everything's going wrong, I still have joy. I can still smile. I can still treat folk right. Cause I know regardless of what I'm going through, if I look to the hills from whence coming my help, after a while, how many know after a while? By and by, God will show up. And not only will he show up, but somebody said he'll show out He'll make himself known. High and lifted up is the God of creation. And that's why when I get a chance, I lift up holy hands. That's why when I get a chance, I raise my voice and say thank you. Thank you for being so good. Thank you for waking me up this morning. Thank you for getting me across dangerous streets and highways. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What do you do? What do you do when you can't see him? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not into your own understanding, but in all your ways. Acknowledge him, and he will. I said he will. If he don't show up today, I'm a living witness. He will. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God for Jesus. Anybody thank God for Jesus? Not only did he come into the world and die, but he rose again so that you and I could rise from the grave and from every situation that attempts to come against us. I can't explain him, but even before I got saved, I used to look at the sky. I said, ain't no way evolution could be real. You don't just get stuff to blow up and fall in place. You don't believe me? Go home, take a vase and throw it down and see if it falls in order. It will be scattered everywhere. God is a God of order. And he has divinely designed and created everything in this world, including you and me. He knows what he's doing. And I can't fully explain him. I can't fully comprehend him. But I fully believe in him. I know I've been changed. And not only do I know I've been changed, my family knows I've been changed. And I know they've been changed. And that's why we're here today to say I've been changed, not by man, not by my own will, but by the grace of God and the power of our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ and the Holy Spirit who has sealed us until the day of redemption. And so the Bible says in Galatians 6 and 9, don't be weary, don't grow weary in well-doing, in due season. 
You will reap if you don't give up. Learn how to wait on God. God knows what you're going through. God knows the trouble that you've encountered. He knows the trials and the, and, and, and the pains that you gotta, that you gotta deal with and you've been afflicted with. Just wait on him. And even if he doesn't show up like you want him to, don't ever doubt his existence. Don't ever doubt his power. And don't ever doubt his Godhead. He is God all by himself. And that's why I always say I love the testimony. I know y'all get tired of hearing it, but I love the testimony of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We don't know what God will do, but we know what he's able to do. But even if he doesn't pour me out of the fiery furnace, I will not bow down to the dictates of this world or even the desires of my flesh because whatever God wants to do in me, to me, or through me, he's got a right because he's God. Give God a hand clap of praise in this house today as we stand on our feet. Knowing your God, one God in three person. We're going to try to break that thing down next week, Lord willing, bring somebody with you as we attempt to share with you how God can be one and three at the same time. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word today. Your word has resonated with the hearts and the minds of those who have heard, not only those who are present, those who are live streaming, and those who are here by way of radio. Now, God, we have planted the seed that we've watered, but it's up to you to give the increase. So if there's any lost souls, any person in here that genuinely knows or at least feels uncertain about their salvation, God, let them not waste another time or another day or another moment, but to come, God, and confess Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, to repent of their sins and to give their lives to you so that you might grow them in your grace. There's somebody here today who has backslidden or gotten away from you as I did, and your mercy and your cords of love pulled me back into the fold. That happens to so many of us, God. We get caught up in the world. We get caught up in the flesh. We get distracted by stuff and things, our perplexities of life. But God, I pray if that person is here today that you would draw them back to you. Let them know, God, they're in dangerous land. They're on dangerous ground if they're not close to you. For you're not only a provider, you're a protector. And you're a preserver. And so God, help that person to come back. Might be somebody here today that's already saved and already has a right relationship with you. That person or those persons don't have a church family. They don't have a body of believers that they're literally connected with to call their own. And I pray, God, if you've sent that person to us today, you've gifted them for us and you've gifted us for them, I pray, God, you let that person come today. There might be somebody here today, God, that they just need somebody to lay hands on them and pray and stand in agreement with them to let them know, God, or to help them to even make a decision about whether they should come to you for the first time or rededicate their lives or become a part of our church family. If that person or those persons are here, have that own way. And now, God, we extend to this congregation, to those live streaming, an invitation to come to you under any one of those categories. We ask, God, you have your own way. In Jesus' name, amen. For, the, for those who are live streaming, you can always write us at First Baptist Church of Jefferson Town, 10600 Watterson Trail, Louisville, Kentucky, 40299. Or you can call us at area code 502-267-6121. But God wants everybody to be saved, and God wants everybody to know him. So if you don't have a personal relationship with God, I'm going to ask that. If we could possibly just cease all walking until we get done, we'll be out in a couple of minutes. But every saint ought to be praying. If you're here today and you don't have a personal relationship with God, would you come forth? You're going back from God or you're not where you want to be and you need to be restored to a right relationship with God. You can come. Or that's, maybe this is you. Maybe you're right with God. You just don't have a church home. If that's you today, would you come? God wants you to come. Be a part of our family. Be a part of the kingdom and help us to complete his will. Man, woman, boy, girl. If that's you today, if you don't have a church home, want to rededicate your life, come to Christ for the first time, would you make that decision? Need somebody to pray with you? Pray for you. Turn the green mic up for me, if you will. Come on. 
Didn't matter. With Jesus, don't be afraid. Don't be ashamed. Thank you. You can fall in love with him all over again. With Jesus. With Jesus. Why? He's the best thing I've ever, ever done. If you never accepted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, come. In his arms, I feel protected. You want to be restored or reconciled, come. In his arms, never did. Never too late. Connected. You can never do so much wrong that God can't fix it. In his arms, you got to trust him. I feel protected. There is no place I'd rather Our last call. Rather be. If you got that desire to come, but your heart or your feet Falling won't move. There are cars in the pews in front of you. Fill those out. Or you can see one of these ministers or deacons or myself as a service. We'll instruct you, take you in the back and instruct Falling you as what you need to do. But don't waste this opportunity. It might be your last. I hope not, but take advantage of it. Amen. Falling in love. Fall in love with it. With Jesus is the best thing I've ever, ever done. Amen. Give God another hand clap of praise. I trust and pray the word has helped you. And as we get deeper into the word of God, God is going to unveil some things to us that will help us to know him, to grow in him and to be better at sowing him throughout this world. Amen. I'm excited about the word of God. I'm praying that you come out on Wednesdays as we continue to grow and as we continue to grow together through his word. Come on out and share in our time. It's only one hour, intentionally one hour. We understand you got other duties and things you got to take care of. We understand people have to go to school. Kids have to go to school next morning. You got to go to work. So you get in by seven, you're out by eight, unless you just decide to stay longer. But do come out. And, uh, and share with us as we grow in the word. God wants all of us as one body. Every Wednesday, we ought to have the same kind of crowd in here right now. Every Wednesday. I know everybody ain't on evening shift. Amen. Come on, talk to me. Everybody not on evening shift. And come on out and join us and share and give yourself time to grow in it. You gotta, you gotta develop habits. You know, the reason we don't come because we develop those habits. You gotta develop a habit. But if you come, I promise you'll get something out of it and it'll start growing on you, and it'll start growing in you, amen. And then it'll start growing through you. And that's what you want, that wherever you go, you touch somebody else because of what God has done through you as a result of being close to him. So I see you on Wednesday at noon, from 12 to 1 or from 7 to 8. Both of those services are preceded by prayer, 30 minutes of prayer, so you can come out and share at this time with us. Let us pray. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus for allowing us to gather here today. We thank you those who are live streamed and we thank you for those who were here by way of radio god i pray that you would help us to become a word church a church that is in love with you and in love with your word more than anything in this world and god that we will come to a point in our spiritual walk with you that god we will easily denounce and refute anything that the world has to offer when we have to compare it to our relationship and our time with you we pray god that you will bless every home and bless every heart here Draw each and every one of us closer to you. Give us a thirst for you and a hunger for you like never before. Help us to pursue you, although we will never fully comprehend you. Help us to learn all about you that we're capable of learning, that we might be intimate with you and know you as you know us. We thank you, God, for all things. And I ask God as we depart from this place, may we never depart from your presence. And may you keep us in perfect peace unto him that is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before his throne with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, dominion, power, and majesty, both now and forever. Let the believing heart say, amen. Also in your bulletin, there was a piece of paper. We're talking about going to Israel. If you desire to go to Israel, please fill that paper out and give it to the usher on the way out the door. Thank you.